Okay, questions on anything? We have a quiz today. Where's it at? The lesson restated. Can anybody restate the lesson for me? Yeah, short, long term, and all groups. That, that if you get nothing out of that book, that those two thoughts should be in your head. So, then Friday we have Animal Farm too. How many are done reading? Uh, the horse has gone to the glue factory. <laughs> He's such a good worker. Uh, what's his name? Boxer. And then what was the? I forget the scene now. There was a bunch of seems like chickens or birds of some kind that all get killed at a certain point. And squealer. <laughs> All animals are equal. Uh, pigs are more equal, or whatever the phrase was. <laughs> All right, it's a good book. All right, somebody finished this statement. This is from the last lecture about personal finances. Debt is to be greatly feared. feared. <laughs> you must be a Democrat. <laughs> greatly feared. All right, um, saving is. Man, wise. There are people that argue that you shouldn't save money because it pulls money out of the economy and it's bad. I, I, that's. <laughs> you need, anyway, it doesn't make any sense, but that's what they argue. All right, insurance is a good. <laughs> I guess I always wanted to come up with some, some alternatives. A good idea or a, a really good idea. So it's a very good idea. And uh, you should have some. Uh, what's a budget? A joke. <laughs> Are we talking about Congress? <laughs> Anybody go listen to Stutzman Sunday night? No. Uh, it was very enjoyable to hear him talking about it. He was talking about the budget process in D.C. And he wants to, if you're familiar with the process of making a law, if he gets in as senator, he's going to propose that they drop the filibuster rule for the budget. What he says happens now is the House will pass a budget and it gets to the Senate and the minority party just threatens to filibuster so they never get to actually pass a budget. And it, it, the, he says the Republicans did it to the Democrats and the Democrats have done it to the Republicans so it can never get through. So he just wants to drop that so it's just a straight up or down vote. So, um, so anyway, the, the, it's a sad joke when we're talking about Congress and they, they haven't had a budget for, I don't know, a decade or something. Uh, but what is a budget other than a joke for Congress? Yes, making a plan of where you're going to spend your money. I was um, listening to Dave Ramsey last night on 560, which I don't think that's a legal station for you in the dorm. So. But anyway, uh, he was on last night, and he talked about a website called everydollar.com, and it's a budgeting website. So I, I'm not going to use it, but they, they do have an option there. You can set up your budget, and you can enter your expenses, and it keeps track of how much is left. As soon as I saw how they were wanting to do it, I thought, I'm not going to get home from shopping and go log into my computer <laughs> and record how I spent my money. So there is an app for your phone if you like to do that. It says just the iPhone do they have an app for right now. But I keep waiting for the, they didn't talk about my uh, Samsung. <laughs> so what's that? It's coming. It's <laughs> coming. Uh, but anyway, the, that, the website was called everydollar.com, and the main thought behind the name was every dollar needs to be given a name. You don't, you know, if you make $1,000 a week, uh, you know, you rich waitresses, <laughs> make $1,000 a week, you don't budget 700 of it and say, wow, I'll get this 300 bucks just to have fun with you. So every dollar gets, gets labeled with something. So I, I didn't look deep into it enough, but um, I, I think it's fine to have some dollars that are labeled miscellaneous. Because <laughs> unless you're really, really pedantic and overly concerned with details and you've got mental problems, if you <laughs> there, there are going to be unexpected minor expenses that come up. You're going to need um, some paper clips for something, something, and you don't want to have a a paper clip <laughs> envelope. <laughs> it's, it's it's fine to have a miscellaneous envelope for that type of thing, but anyway. So a budget, just a plan of where you're going to spend your money. And it's a good idea. I think it's something as stewards to God. It's part of being responsible with the money God has given to us uh, to do there. All right. 
Today I want to do uh, at least two things and introduce a third thing. So uh, we're going to talk about John Locke and William Blackstone. And I think that'll go fairly quick. And then I, I brought everybody some papers. These are some Supreme Court cases. Oh, you should just be getting excited about, man, that sounds fun. Um, don't worry, it's not the whole opinion. <laughs> I stole it from a website, which I did, if you can read the small print down there, I did cite the website. But it gives a summary and gives the question, you know, what, what's the issue that has to be decided. And then I, I, I added myself uh, the excerpts from the Constitution or the laws that were in question uh, to, to help you. Um, I do not want you to Google the name of this court case because you'll, like that, come up with a decision the court made. <laughs> I want you to read it, think about what the Constitution and the laws actually say, and, and try to think, well, what, what's the right decision based on what the, the, the written words here, all right, the, the actual documents, not what the Supreme Court said. So, yes. And then we'll talk about it in class. So you want us to reach a logical conclusion and decide the opposite, basically? Well, I don't want you to try to guess what the Supreme Court did. That would be that. <laughs> no, I want you to think, well, what's actually the right decision here, based on what the Constitution says, or uh, one of them deals with the law? I'm going to pass these out, and I think next class period we'll talk about at least the first one. We'll talk about it, you guys can give me your opinions. I'm gonna trust you not to Google them and find the answer. <laughs> and then I'll tell you uh, how the courts ruled on these different things, so. Um, this is a rabbit trail, but not all Supreme Court cases are boring and dull. Uh, let me read you a quote here. This is from United States versus Miller in 1939. All right. Um, it was about a, a gun that was too short, a shotgun. In the absence of any evidence tending to show that possession or use of a shotgun having a barrel of less than 18 inches in length at this time has some reasonable relationship to the preservation or efficiency of, efficiency of a well-regulated militia. Now, I promise this isn't boring. You probably already are bored. But, uh, we cannot say that the Second Amendment guarantees the right to keep and bear such an instrument. What it's saying is there's no real... At this point, military use for a sawed-off shotgun. So it's not protected by the Second Amendment. Can anybody think then the, the I forget the logic, the contrapositive or, or another statement then that would make sense based upon that. It's saying guns that have no military value are not protected by the Second Amendment. So that things that are of military value are protected. Mil yes. Fully automatic weapons, 50 caliber, the Beretta I keep talking about. <laughs> um, all of those are protected by the Second Amendment. So my Ruger 1022 at home, that can be regulated. But if I bought a fully automatic M16, I have a constitutional right to that. And the, that, was, that was the Supreme Court's ruling. Now, they, they, they've made that statement and then went on to say it's fine to regulate the shotgun and other things. They were, they were supporting... Uh, regulation. But if you actually read what they said, they're saying, well, only guns that have military value are protected. Now, I disagree with that statement. I think any guns are protected. Um, but if you take with their statement as being true, only military weapons are protected. And those are the ones basically we can't buy unless you pay out all kinds of money for fees and, and licenses. <coughs> <laughs> so, liberals talk about, oh, precedent, legal precedent. They never cite that case. Right? <laughs> I would love for them to say, well, back in 39, we ruled that only military guns are protected. So <laughs> that's never cited. So anyway, so not all of them are dull and dry and boring, just most of them. All right, so, well, we'll deal with that. All right, we want to talk about John Locke and William Blackstone uh, today. Hopefully those two names at least you recognize. You know, I've heard that someplace. Um, so. Uh, for both of them, we'll do a short biography, you know, a little bit about their life and what they did, and then talk about some of the ideas they present and come up with in their books. All right, John Locke. Uh, his life span is from 13, well, not 13, 1632 to 1704. If you want it, he was born on August the 19th. 1632 in Somersetshire, England, born in England. Um, typical um, 
Clarence Carson um, called it a mild Puritan house. You know, just a, you know, not, not you know, just a, kind of a, a normal middle class family. 1632. All right, the second point here with his biography a little bit is he grew up and lived in the middle of political and religious turmoil. Now, I know all of you are scholars of English history in the 17th century. So he can remind us some of the things that happened during his lifespan. I say that kind of tug in cheek, but some of these events I believe you would at least heard of. Maybe. Anybody know of anything that happened in the 1600s? Even non-political things. Which Bible are we going to have a seminar for? 1611, when did the pilgrims land? (laughs) 20? Close. You might be thinking of Jamestown. All right, those are before his lifespan, but at least that, you know, he comes along just after that. Uh, is anybody familiar with the English Civil War, where Charles I gets beheaded at the end? I was trying to think. Yeah, that the English Civil War is 1642 to 46. Uh, John Locke was 17 when, when the king was beheaded. Now, it's easy for us to say, yeah, the king was beheaded. I mean, that was, you know, the earth's foundation shook as the king was beheaded. You know, that was, that was amazing uh, stuff for them. All right, so he was 17 when he saw that, lived through the English Civil War, lived through uh, the Commonwealth with Oliver Cromwell, if you've heard of that uh, phase of British history. Then in 1660, we get the Restoration. Anybody know what happened there? That was close. A a king is put back. It's Charles II. I've often thought that would have to be an uncomfortable position to be in. The people that beheaded your dad want you to come back and take his job. You're like, eh, <laughs> I think I'm busy. <laughs> right, but anyway, uh, the Cromwell and the Protectorate and all of that went south. You know, there's problems, insanity, and you know, other things. Um, what's that? I can't remember rule zero now. Keep the army happy. Keep the army happy. <laughs> all right, so there were problems there. So they asked Charles II to come in. That's in 1660. All right, so Parliament bringing back a king. Doesn't go so well with him. So we get to the Glorious Revolution in 1689. And that's where they let Charles leave and bring in William. Okay? It's called the Glorious Revolution because there wasn't any real fighting. Technically, Parliament invited William to invade England and drive out the king that they didn't like. But the king they didn't like left because he knew he was going to lose. So there was no real invasion, but technically this invasion, 1689. And he's still alive at that point. I mean, he, he lived through all of that. Okay, and that's, so he, had, he, he saw firsthand, we're going to we'll, I'll mention some of the things he did here. He, he wasn't in Parliament, but he was involved with people that were in Parliament, and he, he saw lots of the, the behind the scenes and what was going on. So, so he had a front row seat to these things, and uh, gave him a very good position to, at the end of all of that, uh, begin to do some writing. So, so he lived in the middle of a lot of political and religious turmoil, in England. So, all right, uh, continuing on here, is educated originally in medicine. It's really exciting. <laughs> During band. All right, uh, educated in medicine, uh, bachelor's degree uh, in medicine from Oxford, if you want it, 17, 1674. Friends with a couple names, friends with a couple people whose names you should recognize. He wasn't friends with names, I don't think. Uh, Robert Boyle, anybody know that name from chemistry? What were the laws that Boyle developed called? Boyle's laws. Boyle's laws, (laughs) okay. All right, and Robert Hooke from biology, I guess it would be. I don't have it. I think he was the first to uh, see a cell with a microscope. Uh, and he was friends with those guys going through school and was aware of them. So uh, originally trained in medicine. All right, after he got out of uh, school, he became uh, a, a, a personal secretary and doctor to a man named Lord Shaftesbury. He was a, a very prominent member of parliament. It'd be like being the personal assistant to Ted Cruz or something, or uh, if you're on the other side of the world, maybe you know, Harry Reid's personal assistant. You know, you, you'd be the guy that uh, found him after he got thrown off his treadmill. <laughs> About a, I don't know, it's probably been at least a year ago. He started showing up all in his dark sunglasses on, had bruises all over, and his story was he got thrown off his treadmill <laughs> and smashed into the wall. 
Other people speculated he didn't, he didn't he, somebody wasn't happy with him and caught him in the back alley or something. But either way, you would be the, he would be his personal assistant, secretary type thing, and family doctor. So this guy, Lord Shaftesbury, becomes that position in 1675. Now, if we uh, look, if you, you might not have the chronology there in front of you, by that point, we've come through the English Civil War, the Commonwealth, and now we're in the middle of the time frame after the Restoration. We have Charles II back on the throne. We're uh, 14 years before the Glorious Revolution, so we're in between those two. So becomes that position in 1675. Shaftesbury um, falls out of favor because he was um, um, conspiring against Charles the King, Charles II. I haven't looked into it deeply. I've always assumed uh, it was part of the movement that ends up culminating with the, the Glorious Revolution. But whatever the case is, he's involved in trying to get him ousted from power. And in 1783, Shaftesbury flees and Locke, as his close assistant, also uh, flees uh, England. That was 1783. The Glorious Revolution, that should sound strange to you, that was in 1783 because he died in 1704. <laughs> Let's put 1683 there. All right, six years later, we have the Glorious Revolution in 1689. Following that, Locke returns to England. Right? The, the king that he had fled from was no longer in power. He returns to England. At, it was during this time um, he does all of his writing. He, he had some relatively minor positions in the government. He wasn't a member of parliament or the prime, prime minister or anything like that, but had some minor positions in government. Uh, but, it, but more than that, he was very connected, had, was friends with you know, all, very influential people, was still been aware of, of all the, the happenings in parliament, and wrote, wrote his famous works after this point. His most famous are his uh, two treatises of government. The second treatise on civil government is the one that's the most famous, but two different volumes about government. We'll talk about the second treatise on civil government in just a second. Uh, he also wrote, um, I don't have a date for it, wrote one called Letters Concerning Toleration, which we'll just look at briefly. Wrote one about the reasonableness of Christianity. And he would have been a Christian after a sorts, uh, very you know, like like Anglicans and Catholics, and us are all Christians. You know that 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 version of Christianity. So another book, uh, some thoughts concerning education. Uh, if you want dates, the treatises of government are 1690, the Christianity one was 1695, education was 1693, and I don't have the letters concerning toleration. So and all those are written after he turns back to England in 1689, after he's lived most of his life in the middle of all this turmoil and uh, other things that were going on. I really didn't mention, but even with the Glorious Revolution, there's some religious toleration uh, things that come up there with William agreeing uh, to be more tolerant of religion. So. Okay, a little bit about his life. Questions on that? Sarah's just going to pack it up and leave. Fine. We don't like you. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, what he wrote, some ideas he came up with. So, uh, the first thing is that of all the political philosophers, uh, he would have had the most influence on the founding of America. I mean, he, he was uh, extremely influential. Uh, Blackstone as well. Um, he more, though, was, was writing, talking about the laws and what they were and how they should be. Locke is much more just a political philosopher. So anyway, um, massively influential here with the ideology, the thinking of our founding fathers. I'll read you some quotes here and hopefully think, wow, that, those ideas sound familiar. All right. They didn't steal them from Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson stole them from him. <laughs> That's the way it goes. So. All right, let me read you a quote here. This is from a book called Basic American Government by Carson, the one I referenced earlier about the mild Puritan house. Uh, he said that this second treatise of civil government uh, may well have been the most influential book on political theory ever written. All right, so this, it'd, it'd be hard to underestimate how important this book was. Anybody inspired to read that? You're thinking, wow, the most important one ever, and I've yet to read it? Nobody? 
It's sad. There is a copy I, I posted at Schoology, a PDF copy. I'm sure you can find it lots of places, but I was hoping somebody would think, wow, at least I want to look at it. Look at the title, look at John Locke, and think, wow, this is the book. Washington would have devoured this thing and loved it. No? Okay. <laughs> well, since you're not going to read it, let me tell you a little bit about what's in it. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, we're going to do two things here. One, talk about some things that are in the second treatise on civil government. That's the, that's the, if you had to pick one book, that is the one that's the significant one. And then I just want to read you a couple of quotes from letters concerning toleration. It would be religious toleration. But the second treatise on civil government, that's the one that's described as the most influential book on political theory ever written. All right, three points here he makes. I'll give you the point. Uh, and then I've got a, a quote uh, to read you about each point, but we can talk about it. All right, the first thing is he starts out discussing that man, uh, that man is insecure in what he calls a state of nature. Insecure in a state of nature. That doesn't mean we're not safe in national parks, although that sometimes is true. Uh, insecure in a state of nature. What he means by that is in a, in a, in a not a state as in a government entity, but in a, a you know, manner of existence. We're not secure <clears throat> without any rules, without any government. If we just plopped you know, a million people on the earth and there's no government structure, that would be very, very insecure. Can anybody think why that would be insecure? Why would you not be very secure in your life, <laughs> maintaining your property, having freedom to, to move about? Why would that not be a secure position? If there were just evaporate the government, okay, once you get past the joy of that, what problems would that create? There wouldn't be any laws. I just read this morning that I think it's Tennessee. I think it's 300 hours of training you have to go through to, to be uh, licensed to braid hair. <laughs> so that law would be gone. <laughs> That'd be a good thing. <laughs> There was, was a, the Heritage Foundation puts out a, 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 an email called the Daily Signal, and they, they have some very, you should, you should subscribe to it, it's free. Um, <laughs> don't go to Tennessee. <laughs> you, have to, you have to get a cosmetology license to braid hair. That's insane. So yes, laws would be gone. <laughs> don't think of those types of laws, though. Okay. You're going to ask about the hair braiding? Okay, that's probably best, because I don't know much about it. <laughs> Um, no laws. So, so uh, if I like David's computer, I go get my shotgun, I shoot him, take his computer. He loses his life and his property. Not very secure. What recourse does David's family have other than, you know, after they get done celebrating and having the cake? What do they say? Oh, wait, someone just murdered her brother. <laughs> there's, no, there's nowhere to go, okay? His family is then... Let's say his family then responses to come and kill me and get the computer back, okay? You can, you can see that very quickly there's, there's uh, this, in this position really of anarchy where there's no government, there's no security. All right, so he starts out pointing out that in this state of nature, as he calls it, we're very, very insecure. Let me read you a quote here if you wanted. This is some, um, from chapter 7 of this one. Chapter 7, paragraph 87. As I've shown, man was born with a right to perfect freedom and with an uncontrolled enjoyment of all the rights and privileges of the law of nature, equally with any other man or men in the world. So he has by nature a power not only to preserve his property, that is his life, learned possessions, uh, against harm from other men. And I didn't keep going with the quote. I should have kept going with the quote. You can see the, he's making the case of the first half that in this state of nature, everybody has all of these rights from God. And he goes, I'm, I'm sorry, I cut the quote off. I should have put more there. Uh, he goes on to talk about how even though we have all of this power, we're in a very insecure position because everybody has that power. He could kill me because he thinks my watch is really neat or something. I don't know. If he wants my cell phone, <laughs> whatever. Uh, we're very, very insecure. So, sorry, I didn't get the whole quote there, but that's the first point. We're insecure in the state of nature. All right, the second point that he makes is that because of this insecurity, governments are created. You know, bunch of us get together and say, wow, there's a bunch of crazy people out there. Why don't we get together and we'll make some rules that we'll live by and 
you know, we'll designate people to, to guard our property collectively from all the other crazy people. Um, and out of that comes governments. We pick a leader, call him a mayor or a governor or a constable, or, you know, start to pick leaders, start to say, well, who's going to make the rules that we're going to be governed by? And you start, you know, the whole, the whole process, the whole structure comes out of that position of being insecure in a state of nature. So, all right, let's see if I got the right quote here. Um, the obligations of the laws of nature uh, don't cease in society. In many cases, indeed, they pull in tighter there with human laws enforcing them and punishing breaches of them. Thus, the law of nature stands as an eternal rule to all men, legislatures as well as others. The rules that legislatures make for other men's actions must conform to the laws, law of nature, which is declared of the will of God. Okay, so the... Gummer structures form out of that. All right, then the last one, last point we'll make out of the second treatise is that if the government gets out of control, the people have the right to get rid of it. If a group of us got together and said, we're going to make this government structure to, you know, fend off all the wild savages that live outside of our group, and we pick Jacob to be the leader, and it goes to his head, and he starts walking around with a big stick, uh, his, uh, what's that, Patch the Pirate, the Great American Time Machine, his bonkin stick? You guys ever listen to that one? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay, I have little children at my house, so. <laughs> anyway, he gets his special scepter and he whacks people on the head with him and says, no, give me this, give me that, and you know, it's just this raving maniac, you know, pretty much. Jacob acts like himself. Um, <laughs> then the rest of us can say, wait a second. <laughs> uh, we made this structure so that we wouldn't have our property stolen and he's still on our property. This isn't working. Let's get rid of this thing and start over. All right, so it's saying that this thing. <laughs> Let's get rid of him. All right, so if the government, vi I'm sorry, uh, the people have a right to get rid of it. He talks about the idea of um, there being a compact or a contract of government. You might have heard that compact theory, the, the Constitution. It's very valid to think of it as a contract between our government and the people of the country. And if the government violates the contract, then the contract is void. I mean, if, if one of you makes a contract to work at my house and you come and, and you start working and at a certain point I'm supposed to pay you and I don't pay you, it wouldn't make any sense for me to say, oh, wait, wait, we have a contract. You have to come and work. You would say, no, 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 no. You broke the contract by not paying me, so therefore the contract is null and void. He, he uses that analogy about the government structure. We create this structure to protect us. If it starts to take away the things it's supposed to be protecting, it's violated the contract. We can walk away from it. So. Uh, let's see if I got a right quote for this one. <clears throat> um, chapter 19, Dissolution of Government is the chapter title. Makes it difficult to figure out what it's about. Uh, that is because the people who are more disposed to suffer than to right themselves by resistance are not likely to rise up until the mischief has become general and the wicked schemes of the rulers have become visible or their attempts have made themselves felt in the lies of the majority. Talking about rising up against that government. Did anybody think of another document as I read that? Let me read it again, and then I'll read you a, a, a statement from a document that you should be familiar with. That is because the people who are more disposed to suffer than to right themselves by resistance are not likely to rise up until the mischief has become general. The wicked scheme of the rulers, Jacob, have become visible, or their attempts have made themselves felt in the lives of the majority. Here's a quote from the Declaration of Independence. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established not be changed for light and transient causes. Accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms which they are accustomed to. Right, so you can see the same thought. Locke was making the point that this, they're not going to throw out the government just for some light cause. It'll, it'll take a major, major thing. So anyway, that uh, if the government gets out of control, the people have a right to get rid of it. Good. Let me read you two quotes here from uh, Letters Concerning Toleration. This will be talking about religious toleration. <clears throat> it is necessary to distinguish exactly the business of civil government from that of religion, to sell the just bounds that lie between the one and the other, talking about a separation of things the, the church should do and the government should do. Goes on a little bit later. Uh, the care of souls is not committed to the civil magistrate any more to, uh, than to other men. Now again, we're, 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 he's writing in a time frame where in his lifespan, <laughs> the government and the church were, were basically one entity. All right, and he's saying that 
the care of souls is not committed to the civil government, the civil magistrate, uh, any more than to other men. It is not committed to him to say, I, uh, to him I say by God, because it appears that not, it appears not that God has given him any such authority to one man over another as to compel anyone to his religion. So talking about the point that there's, the government doesn't have the authority from God to say, you have to be an Anglican or something like that. So anyway, talk about religious toleration. John Lon, I think I failed to inspire you to go and read his book. Maybe next year. Maybe next year, yeah, okay. <laughs> Should I just uh, make it a requirement next time? To read one and flunk and flunk you, so she need to come back. <laughs> All right, let's talk about Blackstone. William Blackstone. A little bit later in time, uh, he's 1723 to 1780, so he was alive for the start of America and the founding. A couple of things about him: uh, he's born in 1723 in England. Uh, his father died before he was born, so he. Grew up without a dad, um, but is extremely well educated. Ended up finishing his education at Oxford with a law degree. And throughout his life, he held several positions. This is the, the, the jobs he had in chronological order. Uh, a lawyer, that would make sense with a law degree. Teacher at Oxford, it's actually his time at Oxford for which he is famous. Lawyer, teacher at Oxford, member of parliament, and then a judge towards the end of his life. So, you know, Locke we saw, you know, he was a secretary, et cetera. He never really held these positions. Blackstone is a member of parliament. I mean, he, he was, he was the, um, part of the establishment in England. All right, um, <clears throat> the, the book that he's most famous for, the, the thing that brought him fame is a book called Commentaries on the Laws of England. There's actually four different books, four volumes. Um, the first one published in 1765. Can okay, anybody think of how that ties in with America's founding? Right before, 1776 was the Declaration of Independence. Came along just in time to, to contribute to our founding fathers, how they thought about government. So, uh, Commentaries on the Laws of England, first, first book published in 1765, the others after that. There are four volumes. If you want the, the topics, this is the topics. Book one dealt with individual rights, your rights as an individual, he called it rights of persons. Book two dealt with property rights. He called it rights of things, which sounds kind of funny, but you know what? What right does the desk have? He's really talking about the right of the person that owns the thing, rights of things. Talked, the third book talked about civil law. He called it private wrongs. You know, I, I, I do something to you and you sue me. And then the last one is crime and punishment, something he called public wrongs. That would be crime, that type of thing. All right, so those four books. <clears throat> these, these four books, really what he did was he took his, the lectures he was given at Oxford which were very well known and very popular at that point, and he turned them into a book. And we, we get those four volumes out. So these were lectures, really, that just get adapted to book format. Maybe I could become famous. Probably not. So. All right, Commentaries on the Laws of England. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about a little bit of his um, writings and what he did. Uh, first of all, I might have already said this, uh, he had a major influence on the political understanding of, the, of our founding fathers and, and on the whole ideology of the Constitution. Uh, literally for decades in American history, um, if you read and understood Blackstone, you were qualified as a lawyer. I mean, that was, you know, here, read these books. Once you can demonstrate you know them, you're... you're you're qualified. If we went back to that, we would make a vast improvement <laughs> over what So he's very, very influential. So Russell Kirk made this statement about him. He said, although Blackstone was not quite the Solon, Solon was a Greek lawmaker of America, probably no other new nation state has so much, um, 
has been so much governed by a single legal authority from abroad. Until the middle of the 19th century, there was not a few American judges whose chief source of legal knowledge was a copy of Blackstone. So a couple of names that you might recognize, someone named John Marshall, we know him, Chief Justice, first prominent Chief Justice, and somebody that you read, Joseph Story, is that last semester that we had Joseph Story? Those guys were very he heavily influenced by Blackstone. So anyway, major influence. All right, uh, a couple of points he makes here in these commentaries. We'll just look at uh, two of them. And then the, the first one's got several points to it, I'm sorry. All right, first thing he talks about is the importance of natural law. The importance of natural law. He, des he s describes it as just a law of nature. When there's, there's, we have a natural uh, way that we behave given to us by God. It's, it's part of creation. All right, uh, this is a statement from his book. Thus we say the laws of motion, of gravitation, of optics, of mechanics, as well as the laws of nature and of nations. All right, so there's just this natural law that governs everything. All right, uh, a couple points here about this importance of natural law. First of all, he says that this natural law supersedes and exists separate from Constitution, bills of rights, etc. This natural law is something that God created, and then we make we make constitutions, we make laws, we make government structures, and the, the natural law exists separate from that. It'd be like uh, Congress passing a law saying, you know, we hereby dictate that you know, gravitation is in effect. You know, <laughs> gravitation is in effect regardless of what Congress says. Right? No, God has a great sense of humor. He might reverse it or something just to, just to, get, just to play with him. But that, that law of gravitation comes from God. It supersedes Congress. They could pass a law saying it's not into effect and there's still going to be a law of gravity. So this could be a clear argument against uh, gay marriage. Because God could marriage between a man and a woman. It's God's law, not man's and natural law that we see everywhere. Yes. Not Very... And the Bible even calls it unnatural. <laughs> yes, I mean, for Christians and for, for Blackstone, yeah, he would have said this, that's, it goes against the law of God, the law of nature, natural law. Yeah, that, that takes precedence over, over the Constitution. Now, and we can also look at our Constitution. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> that's another topic. But, but yes, that would, that would uh, blast away any, any thought of it. Do you know if that defense has ever been used? As in, it's, it's natural. Uh, not that I know. I've not really looked into all arguments that are made, but I've not heard it be made. I've heard people saying, well, you know, you're undermining 6,000 years of human history and that type of thing. I mean, but we should. We should say, well, this is, I mean, I've heard Christians and people say it, but I've not heard of any, any lawyer or a case where that was argued. I've, heard, I've just heard them referencing culture and precedents and, you know, how do we know better than you know, the last 6,000 years worth of people? That type of thing. Not quite saying, God disagrees with this. My bumper sticker says that. <laughs> but you're right. It, it would undermine the whole idea of, of gay marriage, gender identity. Did you guys hear about the um, ESPN commentator Schilling? Yep. They got fired? Um, that same um, Morning Bell update from the Heritage Foundation talked about a, a series of um, documentaries that they're putting together about, um, I think, um, Major League World Series games. And I guess there's one in 2000 or something where Schilling was a pitcher and had, a, had, had surgery on his ankle or something and was bleeding through his sock and pitched seven endings. I just, everybody talks about the bloody sock game. Anyway, they, they were down zero to three and came back to win. I don't know if it's a World Series, but one of the series. But in, their, in the, the, the um, documentary that they just came out with, they skipped that game. <laughs> you know, the, the one game that made that series famous, they skipped it because it had Schilling in it, the guy who, who just came out and said, I, I don't think guys should be in a woman's bathroom. They fired him for that, and now they're even scrubbing him out of their history. So how did I get to that? The article from the uh, Heritage Foundation, 
uh, reference the Soviet Union in pictures that Stalin had with people in the picture that fell out of favor with him. And you can get, see that same picture through the years and people disappear from the pictures. <laughs> he has them painted out of it. And this one particular one is him and four people. And by the end, it's just him at this table. And he was talking about ESPN doing the same thing, getting rid of people that disagree with him. So. All right, uh, so this natural law supersedes it and exists separate from constitutional law. It's a, it is, you know, constitutional law didn't create this. God created it, and constitutional law should recognize it. So the third point actually is that a civil law should align with this natural law. And it's, it's, um, just as it would be insane for Congress to pass a law, you know, banning gravity, you know, we'd look at that and say, that's stupid, that law is invalid. It just, it, <laughs> it makes no sense. Uh, it's impossible for us to follow it. That same type of absurdity should apply when, when whatever legislative body passes a law that doesn't align with the law of nature. I have in my notes, a law dictating that the moon is always a full moon. You know, they could pass that law, but the law is invalid. And just the same way they can pass a law saying that, you know, war is illegal. <laughs> or you can no longer covet your neighbor's property or something. You know, it's human nature, it's the sin nature, but it's there. You know, they could pass these laws or a law saying that, um, um, you know, if you don't have to pay for your medical coverage, they're gonna pretend like we don't have that, that our, our flesh side that's gonna get as much free stuff as we can, right? It's gonna go against it. Or laws allowing for gay marriage, right? It did, those things, it, they just become invalid because they, they contradict God's law. All right, so natural law or civil law should line up with this natural law. Liberals hate this idea of natural law. I remember when, Car uh, not Carson, um, Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court uh, was getting, going through his approval, um, this idea. And it's come up other times. Do you believe in natural law? Uh, well, of course. And that, to liberals, that, that it undermines their whole ideology. No, there's not a natural law because there's not a God who created the natural order and things. It undermines everything. So anyway, they hate this. All right, so uh, civil law should align with natural law. Next point is man <clears throat> has natural rights that come from God. There are rights that you have that come from God. He uh, talks about um, rights, and he uses this phraseology. He talks about absolute rights. Those are these rights from God. And then he also talks about relative rights. That would be you know, things like privileges of being part of America. You know, I, I get to go to the post office. You know, it's not necessarily a, a right from God to go to the post office. Mean, you know, rights that are just come out of like, the, the civil structure, as opposed to these absolute rights that come from God. Um, of those absolute rights, he splits them up into three categories. Personal security, personal liberty, and right of private property. Those three rights. If you remember the Declaration, in many other places, people talk about these rights from God. And they almost always put them in three categories. They, they sometimes change the titles, but it's referencing these same three, three entities, three different titles. Yeah, the three calls uh, personal security, personal liberty, and right of property. Personal security, light, you know, right to life. You know, nobody else can just come and kill you. Liberty, you can free to do what you want. And the right of property, free to use your property to, to, to whatever you want to do, make yourself better. Okay, so then these natural rights come from God. Hopefully you recognize this phrase from the Declaration. Endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Rights that come from God. There's not to be, they can't, you cannot be separated from them. You know, you have an inalienable heart. <laughs> it's part of your being. I guess now we could take that one out and put a new one in, but that would be painful. <laughs> Barring that, it's part of you. You can't get rid of it. And these rights come from God. So. All right, and then the last point here with this importance of natural law is that the main aim of government is to protect these natural rights. Let me read you a small quote uh, from this, two quotes, but from the same paragraph. 
the principal aim of society is to protect individuals in the enjoyment of these absolute rights, which were vested in them by the immutable laws of nature. Towards the end of the paragraph, he says, Hence it follows that the first and primary end of human laws is to maintain and regulate these absolute rights of individuals. Right? That's the primary job of government, absolute rights. Okay, so natural law. That's something he taught. Uh, a lot of uh, ideas that heavily influenced our founding fathers. All right, the other thing I want to mention for him is the idea of common law. Common law. Um, let me give you a, a definition, just a little bit about common law. But uh, common law is basically this, uh, uh, an unwritten, or at least often unwritten, law that naturally comes from natural law. We have these rights that come from God and like the natural emanations from this. Not always necessarily written down, but just this common law, the, the natural results of the law of nature. Often these things are not written down, <clears throat> and the idea of common gets at the idea that they're common everywhere, like all in, in a country, and also to the idea of that it supersedes countries. I mean, this is common law. It's, you know, people in Germany would have these basic rights. People in England have these basic rights. People in America, it's a, it's a common law that supersedes government. It comes from the natural law, directly from God. So he taught about that idea of common law as well. Questions? I've got to read you one more quote by him. This is good. Free men have arms. Slaves do not. I'm not talking about these things. <laughs> All right, Blackstone.